So, the Falcon Heavy, huh? Damn, son. I don't know about any of you, but I am still recovering from the, the launch on Tuesday. That was one of the coolest things I've seen, like, ever. They put on a hell of a show. It was, it was amazing to watch. They landed two of the boosters simultaneously, which absolutely blew my mind. Um, they got their payload into orbit. They got these amazing shots of the Tesla with the spaceman in it, with David Bowie playing in the background. The whole thing was just an amazing spectacle, and kudos for them. Some of the images that came out of the Starman and the, and the Roadster up in space. I, I think I had the live stream open for about five hours on my computer while I was working. I got no work done. I was just staring at, I can't count the number of times I've caught myself just shaking my head like this, just in disbelief at what I was seeing. There were also some amazing videos of the launch, some amazing photos of the launch. Smarter Every Day did this binaural thing where you can actually hear both the, the takeoff, but also the sonic booms as they came down for a landing. People did all kinds of really great stuff in live streams. I was glad to do it, but there were a lot of other really cool things out there you can go check out. They're definitely worth watching. I'm not gonna go into my reaction to all those different things. You can catch it all in the live stream if you want to. It's always nice to see a grown ass man just, just lose his mess over seeing a rocket. We're, we're all children at some point. But the launch was a, a huge success. That begs the question, where do we go from here? Which is what I'm going to talk about today. So this being a test launch, the main goal for SpaceX was to just collect a mountain of data from everything that they could to make sure that future Falcon Heavy launches are successful as well, even more successful possibly. But as I said at the beginning, they also put on a hell of a show. And some people have called this crass commercialism. I disagree. I mean, it, yeah, that might be part of it, but I think what happened was, was really important for several reasons. First of all, this is some of the most incredible space footage that we've seen in a very long time, maybe ever. You know, we, we get really bogged down in the details of space exploration. Some of it can be kind of boring unless you're nerdy. Some people get excited about anything space related, but to be able to see this, it really opened up the sense of fun and adventure that really only space flight can give you. And let's just get real for a second. We're living in really divisive, some might even say dangerous times. There's a lot of things that are, people are angry about these days. And it was just, I feel like it was really important to have this one moment where we all kind of came together and just gasped in awe at something amazing that was happening and, and we were all experiencing it together. I think the world kind of needed this right now. You know, I actually spoke about this on the live stream a little bit. Somebody was asking whether or not this rivaled uh, the Apollo 11 launch in terms of spectacle and in terms of importance. And I kind of poo-pooed a little bit. It's just kind of hard to imagine it being bigger than the Apollo 11 launch. But I will say there was a viewer, and I apologize, I've, I've, I don't have your name in front of me, whoever this was, that said that they actually were there for the Apollo 11 launch. And this did actually live up to that. I still find that hard to believe, but I'm, you know, I wasn't there. I'm looking at it in hindsight in the historical context, maybe being there, um, you can make that comparison. But that's what this person said, that it was, every bit as exciting as the Apollo 11 launch. So that's, that's, that's awesome. I'll take his word for it. And I did see something that I thought was funny. I just wanted to point it out. David Bowie played Nikola Tesla in the movie, The Illusionist. And then there's a Tesla in space playing David Bowie. So David Bowie played Tesla. And then there was a Tesla playing David Bowie. I thought that was fun. And I'll be honest, there's a tiny part of me that really wants to think that David Bowie was in that suit. Like they, they put his body in that suit and, how awesome would that be? So the flight is definitely a success. The payload got into orbit and did what they wanted it to do. There were a couple of things that did go wrong or that didn't go according to plan. One is the center core did crash. Uh, if you watch the live stream, there was a lot of confusion there. It wasn't confirmed for a while whether or not it made it or not. Uh, but it did, it did crash. It missed the autonomous drone ship, I want to say, by about 90 meters and blew up. Um, we don't know exactly why just yet. I think a couple of engines didn't fire the way they were supposed to. I suspect it might have something to do with the fact that the center core was reinforced to uh, handle all the stresses of the side cores. Maybe that extra weight, something about that had something to do with it. I don't know. We'll find out more as time goes on. The other thing that didn't go quite according to plan was the injection burn for the Mars orbit was actually stronger than they meant for it to be. And it actually is going to go way beyond Mars orbit into the asteroid belt, almost to the orbit of Ceres. But the main thing is they got their payload into orbit and that, 
is hugely important because that gives contractors the confidence to work with them to put their own satellites into orbit. The contractors don't really care whether or not the center core or the side cores for that matter survive. Uh, SpaceX, it matters to them because that's how they keep their costs down by reusing these pieces of the rocket. But, but the fact that it got up into space means that it is now an operational vehicle that people are going to be using for space launches, which is a good segue into what the future holds for Falcon Heavy and SpaceX in general. So the Falcon Heavy is now officially the most powerful operational rocket in the world by a factor of two, which is amazing. But what's more important for their business model is that it's the least expensive launch system in the world. So now the second most powerful uh, rocket in the world is the Delta IV Heavy Launcher from ULA. It can get 32 metric tons of cargo into orbit and it costs between 300 and 500 million dollars. The Falcon Heavy can launch 64 metric tons at 90 million dollars. So twice the payload at a third the price. They expect to have their first commercial launch in the next three to six months. Their first one is going to be this very heavy communication satellite called the ArabSat 6A. And then they're going to follow that up with a satellite for the Air Force that's creatively named Space Test Program 2. That last one will also carry the LightSail 2 solar sail from the Planetary Society, so that's really cool. So those two are this year in 2018. Uh, beyond 2018 and 2019, they have flights in the manifest for a couple of companies, including Mnarsat and Viasat. I had to look down for that one. Uh, as of right now, they don't have any like classified government uh, flights lined up. They are going to have to kind of prove themselves a little bit first for that, but Elon's pretty sure that they're going to have that down for the next year or so. One thing that is interesting, and I talked about this a little bit on the live stream, is that they decided not to rate the Falcon Heavy for human flight. So they're not going to be doing any crewed flights on the Falcon Heavy, which means that it's specifically going to be launching heavy payloads into geostationary and high Earth orbit positions. Now that's kind of niche, but it's, it is important. Not only does it open up new opportunities for SpaceX to do stuff that they can't do now or previously, but it also opens up opportunities for uh, contractors that have satellites that they want to put up there to be able to launch it for less than $300 million. Now something that has been talked about, and I don't know any specifics on this, but Elon has talked about SpaceX putting up their own fleet of uh, internet satellites to give high-speed internet to the entire world. I don't know when that's going to happen, but that's probably something they would be doing either on Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy. It also means that the planned circumlunar mission that they were going to be doing, uh, launching a couple of people around the moon, is not going to be happening. They were originally planning it for this year in 2018, but they have decided that probably the BFR is going to be a better option to do that, and so they're not going to be doing that on the Falcon Heavy. But they are still moving forward with crewed missions on the Dragon crew capsule for the Falcon 9. Elon has said he wants to launch the first test flights of the Dragon 2 capsule, possibly with humans on board, by the end of 2018, which I should have included in my 2018 Year in Science video a few weeks ago, but I skipped that one. The Dragon crew capsule will be used to shuttle astronauts back and forth to the ISS, which is a huge, huge deal because the United States has not had a manned <laughs> space program ever since 2011 when they retired the space shuttle, which is incredible to me. NASA still has an amazing astronaut training program, they just don't have a way of getting those astronauts into space. Seems kind of important. And I don't mean to go on a rant or anything, but that just drives me crazy. I don't, I don't know how we went backwards. How did we go from landing on the moon to having a space plane to having nothing? And we have to actually go to Russia to get our astronauts into orbit. Like somebody, I'm sorry, somebody super dropped the ball and it does drive me crazy. Okay, rant over. So NASA has actually contracted with a couple of different people. There's SpaceX for the Dragon 2 capsule, but also Boeing has a Starliner uh, capsule that they're working on that they also plan on testing at the end of this year. The Dragon 2 was originally supposed to land vertically on rockets, kind of like the Falcon 9 does, but uh, that's been scrapped, I believe, in October of this last year. Elon said that they scrapped that just because it was just too much work. They had these Super Draco engines on the side. Those are there mostly for um, emergency situations, for when launch if something goes wrong at launch, it's an escape kind of thing, but also if they happen to have to land on land, they have the parachutes, but they have the Super Draco engines to slow that down as well. But other than that, they're gonna be landing on water just like most space capsules in the past. So a little bit more about the Dragon crew. It is capable of carrying seven people. It's fully autonomous, although you can do things from inside the cabin as well. The first astronauts that NASA has lined up to go are Robert Benkin, Eric Bowe, Sunita Williams, and Douglas Hurley. 
And the Dragon spacesuits that they have for them are the same ones that you can see on the, the Starman, the Tesla Roadster. It kind of looks like something out of Tron, but those are the SpaceX spacesuits, and they're pretty cool. So with any luck, we'll be actually seeing some astronauts in those suits in the Dragon crew capsule going up into space, hopefully by the end of this year. But what's really exciting about the fact that the Falcon Heavy is not going to be launching people into space is that that means they are focusing even more attention on the one, the only, the BFR. The BFR is, of course, the massive ship that Elon wants to take to Mars. I've talked about this in other videos, but something that I found out recently was that the second stage of the BFR can actually go into low Earth orbit all by itself. It doesn't even need the booster part of the rocket. The BFR is powered by 31 next generation Raptor engines as opposed to the 27 Merlin engines that are on the Falcon Heavy. And with the full booster, the BFR will be able to launch 150 metric tons into low Earth orbit compared to 122 with the Saturn V, which would make it by far the biggest, most powerful rocket ever built. But what's even better is it'll have an even lower cost per kilogram for the cargo than Falcon Heavy does because the entire ship is reusable. In a statement this week, Elon said that the BFR is actually coming along uh, at a really good clip, actually ahead of schedule. He's expecting to start doing some small tests on it in 2019. In the early days of SpaceX, they had a prototype rocket that they called the Grasshopper, which was testing its ability to kind of hover in air and land itself. We'll probably start to see some tests like that on the BFR toward the end of next year. And he said that they're probably going to be using their launch complex that they just built down in Brownsville, Texas, because they apparently have a whole lot of land out there in case something goes wrong. So that's going to be going on. And uh, hopefully by the end of 2019, he's expecting orbital tests on the BFR sometime in the next three to four years, which would put it around 2021, 2022. In his talk this last year in 2017, uh, Elon put the dates for flying out to Mars with the BFR at around 2022 for cargo missions and 2024 for crewed missions. Now he said these were aspirational, which I think is pretty darn aspirational if they're just doing orbital tests in 2021 at the earliest. And keep in mind the Falcon Heavy was delayed five years and that was basically just three Falcon 9s strapped to each other. It turns out there were a lot more problems that they didn't foresee happening. I'm sure there's gonna be just those kinds of problems on the BFR as well. But ultimately Elon wants to not just get to Mars but actually colonize Mars, maybe even terraform Mars, which would of course take uh, centuries to do that. But in terms of when they would actually get this colony up on Mars, you know, if they actually land in 2024, which I don't think they will, that seems aspirational, as he said, but let's just say they do, it would probably take at least five or six launches, I suppose, to get enough people out there for it to become a sustainable colony. There's an 18 month window between launches. So I'm putting that around the mid to maybe even late 2030s before we have a fully functional self-sustaining colony on Mars. I should say, by the way, everything I'm saying from this point forward is total speculation on my part and just a sort of a semi-educated guess. We can definitely talk about this in the comments if you feel differently. But other plans that Elon talked about with the BFR were plans to go to the moon for lunar bases. Now, we haven't seen any concrete plans in terms of them landing on the moon or building on the moon or anything like that. Uh, I will say, though, that the current administration in the United States, the current uh, government has been talking about focusing on the moon again. So if the BFR is up and running before say the Orion spacecraft and the, the NASA projects get up and going, then that will probably be the thing that, that takes us there. I'm suspecting that would be somewhere between 2025, 2030. Now, Elon also talked about using the BFR to get from point to point on Earth, like taking off in New York, landing in Shanghai, that kind of thing. This was one of the more interesting uses of it. I don't think anybody really saw this coming. It was a big one more thing in his presentation last year. I will say I'm more skeptical about this ever coming to fruition because it would use up vast resources in terms of fuel to be able to do that. Uh, not to mention you would have to build a worldwide infrastructure. You would have to have spaceports in cities all around the world. Uh, plus, to get it commercially you know, certified for people to just buy tickets and fly on it would take so many years and they would have to beyond perfect the landing process of all this. It's not so much even just about people being comfortable being on it, because some people would be totally comfortable doing it and taking that risk. It's also about overcoming regulatory hurdles. When you're talking about people buying tickets to get on something, it has to be as close to perfect as possible. And I'll also say, I'm not sure how really necessary it is. I mean, it's cool, don't get me wrong, but is it necessary? Like how many people need to get from Hong Kong to New York in 30 minutes, you know? How, how many people need to do that? And is that worth 
all the infrastructure and everything you would have to build to make that possible. I don't think it is. But they could pull it off. Anything's possible. But I don't think that that would happen until like the late 2030s or 2040s. Elon also talked about going even beyond Mars with the BFR to do interplanetary travel with the BFR. Actually, the original name of the BFR was the ITS, which was Interplanetary Transport System, for that reason. This would use Mars and the colonies and bases that are on Mars, uh, maybe even the moons of Jupiter, the Jovian moons, as way stations to land, refuel, pick up people, do whatever, and then fly throughout the solar system and maybe colonize other places. I will say I am skeptical about the BFR doing this simply because that's way out in the future and there's I'm sure going to be some technologies that are going to come out before then that would make the BFR somewhat obsolete. But if it did, this could happen maybe sometime in the 2050s, maybe 2070s. Again, total speculation. Now anything beyond all that is absolute speculation. Um, you know, when you think about the fact that they made their first successful rocket launch in 2008, that was 10 years ago with the Falcon 1. And now here we are with the Falcon Heavy 10 years later. To be able to try to expect what they're going to be doing 10 years from now or 20, 30, even 50 years beyond that, man, who, who knows? It's, there's no way of knowing, but it is fun to talk about. I should note there are some competitors out there. Um, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin is coming along, as well as Rocket Labs, and their Electron Rocket has been doing some cool stuff lately. I should probably do a video on that at some point. But Elon says he welcomes the challenge. He welcomes the competition. A new space race would be a good thing. And uh, he says, bring it on. But right now, SpaceX and the Falcon Heavy are the ones in the spotlight. And, you know, good for them. They have ignited everybody's passion and adventure for space travel. And here's to more of that in the future. As always, this shirt and many other cool designs are available in the store at AnswersWithJoe.com slash shirts. And if you have canker sores, this video is supported by CankerBoy.com. You can fix your mouth with a daily supplement that makes it go away. Don't get those two things confused. Don't buy a t-shirt and put it in your mouth. That won't help anything. Please like and share this video if you like it, only if you like it. And if this is your first time here and you like this video, um, I talk about a lot of Elon Musk and SpaceX stuff. Uh, please go and check out some of those other videos. And if you dig those, please subscribe. I will keep making these. I want to quickly thank everybody that showed up for the live stream the other day. I had over 9,000 people watching at one point and I almost lost my mind. I didn't even know that was possible. Uh, so many people had some good questions and interactions. I got some super chats and that was definitely appreciated. I didn't get a chance to thank everybody who did that because there, there was just so much going on. But it was a wonderful time. Um, hopefully I'll have some more live streams coming up and maybe when they launch their first uh, real commercial flight, I'll live stream that too. We'll see. All right, you guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I will see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.